The end of the war was signaled by the return of the UNSC forward onto dawn to Earth. The Arbiter emerged as the sole survivor, the Master Chief and Cortana having been lost when the portal from the Ark unexpectedly collapsed, ripping the ship in two. Their fate remained a mystery, but most believed that the Chief had perished in his escape. When the portal collapsed, the immense artifact that generated it suddenly closed, becoming completely inactive. The pathway to the Ark, the Forerunner's final refuge far outside the Milky Way, was now severed. Much of the Covenant had been destroyed in High Charity's fall to the Flood. Those who survived the battles at Earth and the Ark, as well as other more remote conflicts, either found their way back to their own worlds or forged new alliances, some of which closely resemble the original Covenant. The many elites who returned from the war found that great tension had built on St. Helios and its outlying colonies. With the discovery that the Forerunners were not gods, but merely an ancient and powerful civilization, some rebelled against more than 3,000 years of covenant religion. Others held on to the traditions of their past, reluctant to abandon the faith that had united their people for so many centuries. Against this backdrop, warring clans and sects sprang up, some seeking political power, others vying for territory. Despite widespread support for the Arbiter, which stemmed from his central role in bringing an end to the Sanchayum's tyranny and the Jerohanai-led revolt, Sanghelios was far from united. Many Sanghelis still despised humans, and any alliance or friendship with them was viewed as an insult to their traditions. For this reason, the Arbiter's position of leadership among the Sangheli was constantly threatened by those who saw him as a heretic. Civil unrest was not restricted to the Sangheli, however. Most of the remaining human worlds united under the banner of peace, working with the UNSC to safeguard their colonies in the years after the war. But a handful were extremely resistant and sought to declare themselves independent of the United Earth government. Some of these had scarcely survived brutal covenant attacks and blamed the UNSC for abandoning them in their hours of need. Others were drawn to the leadership of political idealists who were anxious to stop any attempts by the UNSC to consolidate Earth's authority. Some worlds even remained outlaw colonies hostile to the UEG, but open for business to the alien species who had, only months earlier, been waging war of extermination against them. In spite of all the uncertainties, colonial unrest and the remnant factions of the Covenant, secret projects humanity had initiated towards the end of the war would allow the UNSC to regain some level of military power in the months that followed. Well before the end of the Covenant War, ONI had initiated plans for the Spartan IV program, a huge effort based on the Orion Protocols of old. This project targeted consenting adult combat veterans for biological augmentation and the use of the newest generation of Mjolnir armor. Spearheaded by Commander Musa 096, who had previously washed out of the Spartan II program due to failed augmentation, a new branch of the military was proposed to UNSC leadership in early 2553. One comprised exclusively of Spartans, and unlike anything the UNSC had envisioned before. Working alongside John A266, the sole survivor of Reach's legendary noble team, Musa began recruiting personnel from across the existing UNSC branches, soldiers who met extremely high criteria. These impressive men and women were augmented into warriors capable of incredible physical feats. 
They were outfitted with Mjolnir Gen 2 armor, the next evolution of the armor Halsey had fashioned decades earlier. One of the Spartan branch's first candidates was Sarah Palmer, an ODST of notable skill and bravery. She became a prominent member of the program and eventually rose to the position of Spartan commander on the UNSC's flagship Infinity. With the branch's growing success, a number of corporations were contracted to produce the costly Gen 2 armor used by Spartan Force. In May 2553, the materials group formed the Damascus Ordnance Commission, bringing in companies such as Lethbridge Industrial, Hannibal Weapon Systems, and Acheron Security to mass produce and refine Gen 2 armor systems. This step reflected a huge change from the relative obscurity of earlier Spartan classes to the dramatic influence they would now have in human-occupied space. Built to defend humankind from an unstoppable foe, the immense UNSC Infinity only came into service after the war had ended. Infinity was designed to be the most powerful warship ever created by humanity, incorporating technology drawn from both the Covenant and the Forerunners. Although it was forged in the fires of conflict, the ship was christened as a vessel of peaceful exploration and the expansion of humanity's place in the galaxy. Nevertheless, this era was not without peril, and Infinity would experience battle on numerous occasions in the aftermath of the war. On March 3rd, 2553, a solemn memorial was held by members of the UNSC at the site of the Forerunner portal artifact, which was now known as the Accession. Alongside esteemed members of other branches, Fleet Admiral Terence Hood presided over the gathering. In a show of incredible trust, the Arbiter was invited to pay homage to those lost in the final battle over the Ark including the Master Chief. This moment would be one of the first steps towards peace between the Sangheli and humanity. Meanwhile, the UNSC took stock of its fleet. All remaining naval assets were gathered to the Sol system in the months following the war. This time was spent accounting for, repairing, and refitting what little remained of the UNSC's previously vast naval force, now amounting to only a few hundred vessels. Plans were also set forth for the design and construction of entirely new vessel types, such as the Autumn-class cruiser and the Striton-class frigate. These ships benefited from many improvements gained during the war, including what had been learned from recovered Covenant and Forerunner technology. The ship which benefited the most from the sudden influx of exotic alien science was UNSC Infinity. Production on the massive, heavily armed vessel began late in the war as one of the many desperate efforts to prevent the Covenant's final victory. Although the ship was completed just prior to the end of the conflict, its official commissioning occurred some years later, as humanity turned once again to peaceful exploration. Infinity's size, remarkable weaponry, and forerunner-enhanced travel capability, however, offered formidable military support in times of unrest. Infinity made one thing very clear. With the discovery of the Forerunners and the remarkable technology they had left behind, humanity would never be the same. Many of these discoveries came from the Halo installations, as well as at sites like the Accession but by far the most fruitful source for the unearthing of Forerunner relics was the gargantuan artificial world Onyx. When the artificial world Onyx disintegrated, 
All that remained was a 23 centimeter orb locked in real space around the star Zeta Doradus. But within this seemingly insignificant object was a slip space enclosure holding a massive Dyson sphere, its diameter the size of Earth's orbit around the sun. The sphere was habitable on its interior surface with its own sun at the center, creating an eerie similarity to a natural world. Having cut off the Covenant's access to the sphere using a nuclear weapon, a group of human survivors made their way inside. The enormous installation displayed the Forerunner's mastery of technology and opened the doors to remarkable possibilities for humankind, if the group could find a way out. Together, they began scouting the interior of the vast world, hoping against all odds to find some way back to real space and the UNSC. Just before the end of the war in 2552, mankind stumbled across a number of extraordinary sights created by the ancient race of beings known as the Forerunners. These would be the source of previously inconceivable advances in knowledge and technology. Alpha, Delta, and Gamma Halo installations were revealed during the final few engagements with the Covenant, yet the most extravagant of all these discoveries had been under humanity's nose for decades. Zeta Doradus IV, also known as Onyx, was highly suitable for colonization, and was surveyed by early groups of pioneers. Remarkable discoveries on its surface led the ONI to render the world classified, removing it from databases and star charts while it secretly explored. However, when the Covenant War ignited across human space, those efforts were largely abandoned. Only a small number of UNSC facilities still operated. These included Camp Kurahi, which hosted the highly classified Spartan III training program. When the Onyx conflict of November 2552 revealed that the planet was, in fact, an artificial world created by the Forerunners, a handful of human survivors had already found their way to an aperture at the planet's core. They included the Spartan II's Frederick 104, Kelly 087, and Linda 085 of Blue Team, as well as Dr. Halsey, Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez, and the remaining Spartan threes, Tom B292, Lucy B091, Mark G313, Ash G099, and Olivia G291. Upon entering the aperture, they were transported to an immense slip space enclosure, a vast Dyson sphere with a shell-like habitable interior surface. Although the surface of this world closely resembled any oxygen and water-rich blue-green planet, it was in reality a shield world, a heavily insulated sphere that could keep its contents safe from both the flood and the deadly effects of the halo array. With no apparent way to leave the world, the group forged a path across the lush terrain, eventually finding a series of forerunner structures. Here, they discovered one of Onyx's most important secrets, the Huragok also known as engineers. These artificial creatures were used by the forerunners to maintain and repair their timeless installations and technology. And when Lucy B091 made contact with one of these, it gave them access to communication with the outside world. Working in collaboration with the ONI, they were finally able to transition the fast shield world from slip space into real space. The massive sphere would now occupy much of the Zeta Dorada system, 
locked in close orbit around its sun. It was not long before the ONI set up a complex of research facilities across Onyx's boundless interior surface and codenamed it Trevelyan. The name was taken from Kurt Ambrose's birth name because of his sacrifice to seal off the shield world from the Covenant. Expeditions were sent out from Trevelyan across the shield world, exploring, recovering, and analyzing technology that had been hidden for eons. The treasure of Onyx was humanity's most promising fount of innovation, pushing the boundaries of all that had come before. The Black Ops squad, known as Kilo 5, was created by the highest levels of the ONI to sow unrest among humanity's enemies, keeping them destabilized so that mankind was never forced to face a threat as great as the Covenant. This group of highly skilled operators was often found working in the blurry area between good and evil aiding the wicked for the sake of peace, and even targeting people who may have been justified in their actions. The members of Kilo 5 were forced to forever weigh their actions against the greater good. In the aftermath of the war, ONI Admiral Margaret Perengoski formed Kilo 5, intent on disrupting any potential threats against humanity by whatever means were necessary. At the head of Kilo 5, she placed Captain Saren Osman, who had failed augmentation for Spartan II, but was later rehabilitated and reintegrated into the Navy. Also on Kilo 5 were a trio of experienced ODSTs, Staff Sergeant Malcolm Mal Geffen, Corporal Vasily Vaz Beloy, and Sergeant Leon Dev Devereaux, as well as Naomi 010, one of the few known active Spartan twos. Rounding out the team were Professor Evan Phillips, an expert in Sangheli culture and language, and Black Box, a highly advanced fourth generation smart AI. Kilo 5's main objective was aiding Sangheli terrorists in order to keep the elites divided and at war. The squad brokered a deal with Avu Med Telekam, the leader of the Servants of the Abiding Truth, in the primary opposition to the Arbiter. Kilo 5 provided these dissidents with weapons while the UNSC publicly supported the Arbiter from Earth. Only months after the war's official end, Telecam emerged from hiding and attacked the Arbiter's forces at the fortress of Vadam Keep. The assault failed when the Arbiter was helped by the UNSC Infinity, forcing these servants back underground. The ONI had succeeded once again in undercutting both sides. One of Telecam's former allies, Jewel Dama, escaped UNSC captivity on Trevelyan and began to put together an even more powerful military force on the remote world of Hesdoros. Embittered by decades of hatred towards humanity and the loss of his own wife at their hands, the Sangheli warrior wanted revenge. He had learned of a hidden world called Requiem, reputed to be the resting site of an ancient forerunner commander the Didact, who also despised humanity. If awoken and released, he might assist the Sangheli in exacting revenge. Dama's new covenant was formed around this objective. The most important of Kilo 5's operations in 2553 was conducted on the outlaw colony of Venezia where a human arms dealer by the name of Staffan Sinsky had emerged under deep cover members of Kilo 5 infiltrated Sinsky's cell. They learned that his motivations hinged on the loss of his daughter decades ago, 
and that his daughter was none other than their own Naomi 010. Zinsky intended to acquire a Covenant warship called Pious Inquisitor and use it against the UNSC. Empathizing with her father, some members of Kilo 5 managed to fake Zinsky's death in the destruction of Pious Inquisitor. With the ship gone and his daughter alive and well, the threat Zinsky post was now diffused. In the months that followed, Kilo 5 continued to disrupt reunification of the Sangheli and carried out numerous black ops requiring their particular expertise. Osman eventually went on to replace Perenkoski as commander-in-chief of the ONI, while the status and operations of Kilo 5 remained highly classified. After the breaking of the Covenant, the Sangheli hero known as Thel Vadam returned home bearing the title and armor of the Arbiter, once considered a mark of shame, now worn as a badge of honor. During the course of the Great Schism, minor conflicts had raged across parts of Sanghelios, but the real turmoil was social, political, and religious. The Covenant's sudden end and the revelation of the Forerunner's true nature created a dangerous vacuum of government and cultural identity. While the Arbiter did not seek the role, the people of the territory of Vadam and the keeps around it backed him as the new leader of Sanghelios. Other sects opposed him and conflicts broke out as local leaders vied for power. Some of these cited religious beliefs, still persuaded by the tenets of the Covenant. Others acted out of hatred of the Arbiter's alliance with humanity, and others simply wanted to make a name for their own clan. This conflict eventually escalated into a civil war, which would last years and span not only Sanghelios, but other worlds as well. Upon returning home in early 2553, the Arbiter traveled from clan to clan, attempting to broker peace and consolidate all of Sanghelios under the same banner. These efforts were abruptly halted when the state of Adam was targeted by the servants of the Abiding Truth. Led by Avu Med Telkam, the siege at Kalar in March 2553 was the first of a number of assaults on the Arbiter and those who supported him. Telkam was thwarted by the arrival of the UNSC Infinity, which had provided direct support for the Arbiter and his forces entrenched at Vadam Keep. The powerful human vessel's counterattack drove the servants of the Abiding Truth back into hiding, but the end of this battle did not signal peace for the rest of Sanghelios. With the servants' bold move to unseat the Arbiter, the rest of the planet was thrown into chaos. Pockets of violence erupted across much of Sanghelios. Clans battled for dominance in their local regions, while packs of Cheryl Hanai serfs led brief and isolated revolts across the planet. Although much of this unrest was put down in the months that followed, a constant stream of civil war persisted across the elite homeworld for years growing to include other colony worlds and involving numerous ideologies and sects. The Arbiter's forces eventually consolidated their strength under a single banner, the Swords of Sanghelios, an ancient title of honor expressing the nobility of their cause, the unification of the Sangheli people. The efforts of the Swords faced a severe threat from yet another movement, Hidden on the remote colony of Hesduros, led by Jul Dama, who had once operated within the servants of the Abiding Truth, this new force rekindled the war forges of old, gathering lost weapons and ships. Both Kigyar and Unganoi joined what would now be seen as Reforming Covenant, hoping to awaken an ancient forerunner from his slumber. 
Though it would be years before that hope would be realized, the Didac's return would threaten not only humanity, but the Sangheli as well. When an automated distress signal was triggered on the world of Shops 3, a number of Forerunner line installations activated, a network of machines once designed to stop the flood. On the independent human colony of Gao, the Forerunner Ancilla Intrepid I was suddenly awakened from her hibernation and forced to assess the state of her own facility. Intrepid Eye's activities led to an earthquake and release of Rome's Alone, a life worker Huragak capable of repairing living creatures. Humans visiting the Montero Caves on Gao began experiencing mysterious healings caused by the Huragak. But with the caves now teeming with humans in search of medical miracles, Intrepid Eye was forced to kill those who interfered with her work creating a string of unexplained murders. Gao authorities sent Special Inspector Veda Lopez and her team to solve these crimes. The UNSC, meanwhile, had also detected the distress signal and deployed the 717th Xeno Materials Exploitation Battalion to Gao to investigate and eventually target the Ancilla for capture. Amid much political controversy due to the colony's strong resistance to the UEG, its president reluctantly agreed to the battalion's presence on Gao. But when the murders began to occur, many suspected that the UNSC's battalion was involved. Though the UNSC's true purpose was highly classified, Arlo Casile of the Gao's Ministry of Protection, who despised Earth's governments, became aware of the battalion's goal and planned to take advantage of the situation in order to seize control of the colony's government. Secretly plotting with the Jeral Hanai terrorist group called the Keepers of the One Freedom, he pitted the alien force against the UNSC battalion in a fight to secure the Forerunner AI for himself. Meanwhile, Lopez's murder investigation turned up clues pointing to the center of the battalion's security force, the Spartans of Blue Team. Led by Frederick 104, Blue Team included the Spartan 2s, Kelly 087 and Linda 058, as well as Spartan 3s, Tom B292, Lucy B091, Ash G099, Olivia G291, and Mark G313. When the investigation took Lopez deep into the cave system, she accompanied Fred as part of his team. After a brief engagement with the Intrepid and the AI's drone's defenses, the Ancilla was eventually captured by the Spartans. Emerging from underground, however, the group discovered that a battle had broken out between the UNSC battalion and the Keepers within the nearby town of Windosa. Although UNSC forces managed to stave off the Keepers' vicious attack, Cassiel, having by now seized control of the Gao government, sent local military to destroy what remained of the battalion. The Spartans and Lopez, who had now come to realize that Intrepid was responsible for the murders, escaped the Gao attack with the Ancilla in their procession. Before leaving, Blue Team managed to completely destroy the Lion installation, severing Castile's ability to use the Forerunner technology to his advantage. Lopez's cooperation with the Spartans alienated her from Gao's government which she now realized was corrupt. During the Spartans' extraction, Saren Osman offered Veda an opportunity to join the ONI, which she accepted. Despite a harried and costly escape by UNSC forces, the battalion had managed to secure Intrepid Eye for research, though at the cost of continued hostility from Gao's government. 
The bloody battle on the colony of Gao was an object lesson for the UNSC about the risks of dealing with independent colonies that harbored hatred towards the UEG. Although the battalion managed to secure the forerunner Ancilla they had targeted, it did so at a cost. Hundreds of lives were lost in the battle, and control of Gao was transferred into the hands of Cassil, a zealous anti-UEG politician. Gao had joined the growing list of independent colonies who had no reservations about lashing out at the UNSC if their sovereignty was threatened in the slightest. The Sangheli leader of the Fleet of Retribution and its flagship Shadow of Intent, Atas Vadum, also known as the Half-Jaw, represented the Old Guard, weary of the long years of war. But when a threat emerged from the vestiges of the now shattered Covenant, he and his small crew were all that stood in its way. Allied with a female Sangheli noble called Sion, Badum opposed the Minister of Preparations and his prelate, a powerful Sanshayum warrior, who were plotting to use a prototype halo ring against the Sangheli homeworld. After the fall of High Charity, the San Shayum, known as the Minister of Preparation, sought to take revenge on the Sangheli. Preparation knew of a secret weapon hidden in a remote star system, a smaller prototype halo installation, capable of a tactical strike against a fleet or even an entire world. The San Chayum minister intended to harness the power of the legendary warship Shadow of Intent, currently in the possession of the Half-Jaw, to fuel the prototype halo in an attack on San Helios. For this mission, Preparation chose his ally, the Prelate, a remarkable San Chayum warrior, rare within their species. The prelate believed that Halfjaw was responsible for his family's death at the hands of the Flood. To lure in the Shadow of Intent, the prelate's forces butchered innocent Sangheli on a number of elite border colonies. The campaign of slaughter came to a head near the colony of Duran, where the Halfjaw finally confronted the prelate. The Sanchayam warrior initiated a daring boarding action from his cruiser, Spear of Light, sacrificing his own vessel in order to launch escape pods directly into the hangar bay of Shadow of Intent. Defending the ship alongside the Half-Jaw was the Scion, Tol Joran, a female warrior from the colony of Raynello. The Scion had lost her father and brothers to the prelate's assault on her homeworld. She swore revenge and joined half jaws crew, despite the Sangheli's predominantly male tradition of warriors. Although they managed to stop the raid and capture the prelate, the attack was only a ploy to lure Shadow of Intent into the sights of the Halo. Vadum saw through the ruse and made alternate plans allowing his ship to be fired on after its crew was safely away. The prelate escaped from Vadum's custody, but began to realize that it was the Minister of Preparation who had been ultimately responsible for his family's deaths, rather than the half-jaw. In the skirmish that followed, the minister fled and attempted to fire the halo again. He was prevented by the prelate, who sacrificed himself to destroy both the prototype halo and preparation, while the half-jaw and the scion managed to escape. In the aftermath, Rataz Vadum found a new purpose, to scour the galaxy for the remaining San Shayum and to ensure that any who posed a threat to his people would be silenced. When the Halo Array mysteriously primed for activation, the entire galaxy was once again threatened, this time from a source that was completely unknown. 
the ONI was forced to send a hybrid team of humans and Sangheli back to the Ark, the only location from which the rings could be activated, in order to determine the cause. Upon arrival, they found the massive Forerunner installation seriously damaged and racked by severe weather conditions. Its surface, once a reserve for species from across the galaxy, was now covered with hostile predatory creatures and guarded by a deadly Forerunner AI. Shockingly, this mysterious entity was attempting to mine Earth into oblivion in order to repair the damage done to the Ark years earlier by the humans. In early 2555, Forerunner researchers Luther Mann and Henry Lamb stumbled upon something strange while exploring the newly discovered Zeta Halo. The Halo array suddenly primed and began counting down to activation presumably due to a signal from the Ark. The ONI had secretly launched several expeditions to the Ark since the war, using the slower conventional slipspace technology, but all of them had ended in an ominous loss of contact. With their backs against the wall, they were now forced to send another. The ONI created a joint team of humans in Sangheli including Man and Lamb, Captain Annabelle Richards, and the Sangheli Intho Sraum, and Yuzi Taham, who had served alongside the Master Chief during the final battle against the Covenant. In addition to standard UNSC troops, the team also included Spartan Fours, Frank Kodiak, and Elias Holt, and the operation was supported by Specialist Olympia Vale, who worked with an ONI as a diplomatic liaison to the Sangheili. After reactivating the portal, the team ventured through the Sangheili Corvette Mayhem, but were assailed by the Ark's defending Strato Sentinels and forced down to the installation surface. Setting off from Mayhem's wreckage, they immediately came under attack by the Ark's aggressive wildlife. These beasts were later revealed to be directed by 000 Tragic Solitude, the installation's hostile Ancilla. In the aftermath of one such attack, Vale was abducted by Solitude. The Ancilla explained that he intended to activate Halo, and then use the resources in the Sol system to repair the Ark. Solitude hoped that he would persuade her to stay. He knew that her status as a Reclaimer gave her access to all Forerunner systems on the Ark. Vale refused, however, and Solitude's plans were soon thwarted when the team succeeded in halting the Halo's activation. In a last-ditch effort, the Ancilla sent legions of weaponized Strato Sentinels through the portal to Earth, colliding with a waiting fleet of UNSC vessels. Earth fought desperately against a seemingly endless flood of Sentinels, a ploy that Solitude hoped might compel Vale to cooperate. But during the conflict, the AI was sabotaged by Vale's teammates and eventually destroyed. By the time the survivors returned to Mayhem, the UNSC had sent recovery vessels after it, deploying makeshift fire bases and research facilities on the installation. With the halo threat averted yet again, the Ark was now occupied by ONI research teams, seeking to safely repair the damage done to it. After their heroics at New Mombasa, the ODS team known as Alpha 9 was pulled from the front lines. When the war ended only months later, the squad, still composed of Buck, Romeo, Dutch, Mickey, and the Rookie were deployed against human rebels rather than against the Covenant. After the death of the Rookie on Draco III in January 2554, the shift in the focus began to wear on the team. In the wake of this loss, 
Buck was approached by John A266. Months earlier, he had been offered a slot within the Spartan 4 program, but refused to abandon Alpha 9. This time, however, the rest of Alpha 9 could be included. While Dutch planned to leave the service, both Romeo and Mickey joined alongside Buck, and by 2554, all three were fully augmented Spartan 4s. After being deployed on a number of missions, Alpha 9 was sent to Talista by ONI. The rebel militia located there had somehow stolen Virgil, a critical Huragok asset from under the protection of the ONI and its handler, Sadie Indesha. Early in the operation, Buck and Romeo were betrayed by Mickey, who, discontented with fighting against fellow humans, had defected and aligned with rebel leader Dr. Anton Schein. Although the odds were stacked against them, Buck and Romeo managed to subdue their captors, immobilizing Mickey and killing Shine, and successfully completed the mission. The Talitza incident served as a warning for the UNSC, who were forced to acknowledge the risks involved in the recruitment of the new Spartans, even those who had loyally served the UNSC for years. In February 2556, while targeting an arms deal on the colony of Cedra, ONI Lieutenant Commander Jameson Locke and his team witnessed the detonation of a mysterious bomb by a Sangheili terrorist killing hundreds of humans. This bomb used an exotic agent that targeted humans at a genetic level. Locke's team eventually discovered that it came from a fragment of Alpha Halo. During the ring's destruction, the installation's automated safety protocols had jettisoned a portion of it through slipspace in an effort to save it. The fragment ended up in orbit perilously close to a star, making conditions on its surface extraordinarily dangerous. Locke's O&I team was sent to this shard alongside a detachment of Cedron Colonial Guard led by the ex-Spartan II Colonel Randall Aiken. The mission was to destroy the deadly element with a nuclear weapon. Upon arrival, they found the fragment's already extreme conditions were compounded by a vicious strain of Let Golo, which relentlessly hunted the team. After narrowly surviving an attack which heavily damaged their ship, the team began to disagree over the mission. As tensions rose, some of the team became hostile, forcing them all to race for the nuclear weapon and away back to human space. Ultimately, Colonel Aiken sacrificed his life by detonating the nuke, allowing Locke to escape. This grim mission proved to be a key moment for Jameson Locke, leading to his decision to become a Spartan. <laughs> 